Hello and welcome to this exclusive Nordic AmCham session on the U.S. presidential election. My name is Peter Dahlen and I'm the managing director of the American Chamber of Commerce in Sweden. So today we're going to take a look at the U.S. presidential election, which is as of today, eight weeks away with Steve Scully, who is C-SPAN's senior executive producer, political editor and primary host. What is more, just last week it was announced that Steve will be the moderator for the second of the three debates between Donald Trump and Joe Biden um, in October, on October 15th to be precise. So originally Steve was going to be our special guest at Almadalen, which is Sweden's biggest um, annual political policy happening. And when that was canceled by COVID, we were thrilled that Steve could join us in this setting to give us an insider's look at the election. So AmCham Sweden, in, in partnership with our fellow Nordic AmCham, is pleased to welcome you to this exclusive session. And I'd like to give my colleagues and friends in the uh, AmCham Nordic community a chance to welcome you all, starting with my friend uh, Jason, who runs AmCham Norway. Thank you very much, Peter, and uh, a warm welcome and thank you uh, for joining us, Steve Scully. It's a it's a pleasure to host you on this uh, on this platform. Uh, what a unique opportunity for uh, AmCham Norway and for all of our members across the Nordics. So thank you very much. And also, I would like to thank uh, Peter and Randy for all of their uh, support along the way. Uh, look, uh, it's an important time. Um, uh, we get questions and this issue uh, of what's going to happen in the election comes up on a not even daily, an hourly basis in our meetings uh, with our stakeholders. So um, we're, we're certainly proud to be able to uh, to host you and, and get a more in-depth uh, kind of uh, look on what's going on as compared to some of uh, some of what's happening in the media here, uh, which seems to kind of uh, brush on the surface of the day's uh, events. So again, thank you very much. And uh, with that, I will hand over to my counterpart, Alexandra in Finland. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexander Pasternak Jackson. I run AmCham Finland. It's a great pleasure on behalf of the AmCham Finland business community to welcome uh, you. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, and my Nordic friends. Um, I think, you know, every time we do something like this, I'm reminded by the strength and the power of the Nordic AmCham network and the way uh, we're able to bring you this kinds of information. So welcome, tervetuloa, velkommen, and thanks so much uh, for being here. And now on to Stephen from AmCham Denmark. Hey, thanks, Alexandra. And uh, thanks to, uh, and welcome to all the AmCham Denmark members tuning in this afternoon. And also on my, from my side, a special thanks to AmCham Sweden for organizing this. And I'll just uh, uh, mirror what everybody else has said, my colleagues. It's a very strong network in the Nordics. We really like working together. And the oper you know, COVID has its upsides because it allows us to bring these types of events to everybody. So uh, hope you enjoy the session. And thanks to you, Steve, for uh, being on the call. Thank you, Steve. Then this is, um, you know, we're really thrilled to have the cooperation and collaboration that we have with all of you, and um, and we're we're super excited to have with us today our fantastic guest in in Steve Scully. So Steve, as many of you already know, he's one of Washington's most experienced uh, political journalists. He's responsible for coordinating all aspects of C-SPAN's campaign programming across all their channels, all their media properties. And for those of you on, on this call who don't know what C-SPAN is, it's, a, it's the Cable, cable Satellite Public Affairs Network that was started in 1979 by the cable industry in the U.S. It's a nonprofit public service that televises many proceedings of the U.S. federal government as well as other public affairs programming. So in addition to that, you know, Steve also manages a team of field producers and he's responsible for the editorial coverage of the White House politics and, uh, and special projects. He's managed election coverage for every presidential race since 1992, overseeing C-SPAN's Road to the White House programming and developing media partnerships with CNN, NBC and the Associated Press. And Steve has interviewed every U.S. president since Gerald Ford. So it gives me great pleasure to um, to turn things over to you, Stephen. Thank you for joining us. Well, indeed, it's my great pleasure and uh, thank you. So 
One other part of my biography is that I spent uh, seven months at the University of Copenhagen and had the great chance to travel to Reykjavik and to, uh, to Norway, to Oslo, to Stockholm. Alexandria had not yet been to Helsinki, so I promise that is on my list. So I'll say Tusen Tak. Thank you for the opportunity to be with all of you. I lived in a town called Ruskilda, which is, I think, about 30 miles outside of Copenhagen. It was an incredible experience because it really immersed me into European politics. So I'm, I'm thrilled and honored to be here. And um, in the tradition of C-SPAN, uh, we try to be the Switzerland of the media. And so I'll, I'll try to give you kind of a, a, a nonpartisan view of where we are in this country. Um, look, I don't have to tell you that these are very polarized times from COVID-19 to race relations in this country, to the economy. I mean, we are dealing with, uh, you know, the intersection of events that I don't think we've quite seen uh, since the mid to late 1960s. So the first piece of advice I would give you is expect the unexpected in this election with 56 days to go, as you mentioned, eight weeks before election day. And don't believe the polls. Uh, Donald Trump has a path to victory in this election. Uh, he may not be ahead in the popular vote, but he very clearly could win in some states that uh, are key to him. A new poll out today shows Joe Biden ahead in Wisconsin, but uh, the president you know, cutting into that lead. One poll has the president uh, dead even in Minnesota, which has become a, a, a more of a red state outside of Minneapolis, St. Paul. But then the Democrats are doing better in states like Arizona. The key, of course, is going to be Florida. Uh, whoever wins Florida, I venture to say, is going to win the presidency, which is why there's so much effort by both the Democrats and the Republicans. Yes, Pennsylvania is going to be important. The so-called blue wall that uh, did not work for Hillary Clinton back in 2016, uh, which is why yesterday you had two of the vice presidential candidates, Vice President Pence and uh, Senator Kamala Harris, in Wisconsin dueling it back and forth. And uh, of course, uh, Vice President Biden in um, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the president on the campaign trail again later this week in Florida. So there will be a small number of states that will determine the, the election, but I think Florida uh, once again is going to be key. We should also know that there will be some October surprises. Um, I will never forget being in the debate hall in St. Louis the weekend after the Access Hollywood video was released. And of course, that was front and center in this uh, election. And then after that, we had the Hillary Clinton emails. So we're bracing ourselves for, for whether it's a development with COVID-19, an international development, uh, that there will be something that will happen that will in some way affect this election. And I think both campaigns are prepared for this. And what you have right now is the basic framework of how the Democrats and the Republicans are viewing this election. Uh, if you look historically, uh, four of the last five presidents we have reelected to a second term, but also the last two Republican presidents, George W. Bush and Donald Trump, did not win the popular vote in their first term. Bush, of course, did win reelection in, in 2004. And you look at past history in, in modern times, you can go back to Jimmy Carter and George H.W. Bush. They both lost in large part because of the economy and even to Jimmy Carter's uh, uh, re-election, the economy and international events, most notably the Iran hostage crisis. So we look at history to see, is it gonna be a continuation of the last four of the five presidents uh, re-elected or is this gonna be more like Jimmy Carter and George H.W. Bush? The one thing that makes this so fascinating is that President Trump is the master when it comes to trying to, to turn attention to something else. I compare it to the shiny object, uh, the latest tweet or the latest charge. And we're hearing that now as the president tries to divert attention from COVID-19 and much more to uh, law and order. Very reminiscent in many respects of what we saw in 1968 in the, in the campaign with Richard Nixon. The difference is though, Nixon was the challenger in 68 in this case, Donald Trump is the uh, is the incumbent running for re-election. And the other lesson from history can be in 1992 when Bill Clinton very effectively said, it's the economy, stupid. One of the biggest mistakes that I think Hillary Clinton made in 2016 is her inability to give the voters a clear reason why she wanted to be president. It was a little bit like, you know, I'm going to be uh, continue Barack Obama's policies, but I'm also going to focus on X, Y, and Z. You've got to have a clear agenda. It's the economy, stupid. Leadership for a change like Reagan in 1980. And so that's what I think voters are going to be wrestling with in, in these times. And people vote their pocketbook. I mean, you're all in uh, trade and business and, you know, 
the U.S. is is your leading trading partner outside of the European Union. And so that's going to be a very big issue. The economy is going to be a very big issue. The stock market has been uh, going through gyrations lately. And I think we're going to see more of that as we get into late September and October. But people vote pocketbook. So what we have now is record unemployment a few months ago coming back for some people. But there's a great piece in the Wall Street Journal that compares this to a K recovery. So those on the upper uh, echelons are going to continue to do well, but those on the lower levels, uh, if you're a sanitation worker, if you're a uh, retail uh, store clerk, if you're working in, in the hospitality industry, you're on the downwards uh, spiral. And so that's something to keep in mind. Looking at all the national polls, focusing on the economy, what we're seeing right now is that the president still maintains a lead by 8, 10, 12 points, according to Real Clear Politics. So the president has the edge on economic issues. Where the Biden campaign has the edge is on coronavirus and on BLM, Black Lives Matter. So those are where the campaigns are going to really focus their attention with the Biden campaign trying to hit hard on uh, coronavirus and on the economic slowdown that we've seen in the economy, whereas the president just yesterday saying is going to be the biggest economic year next year. I've created the, the, the greatest economy once. I can do it again. Um, and, and the last thing is that um, that um, we have to look at history, but we also realize that this president is different. I mean, he's just a very different personality. Uh, the norms have changed with this presidency, and, and maybe it will change for future presidents. Um, but uh, we have seen that um, he is going to be aggressive. He's going to hit hard. Uh, the Biden campaign is already ramping up its campaign efforts to try to get him on the road much more than we expected even a week or two ago. Uh, and so I guess my closing comment before we get to questions is buckle up because it's going to be quite a ride between now and uh, November 3rd. And as we mentioned, uh, I was talking to some of the folks beforehand, this may not be resolved by November 3rd. I'm advising our staff here to prepare for election week, maybe election month. Uh, I lived through Bush v. Gore, and so we know very well that um, the results may not be, uh, especially with, with mail-in voting, may not be finalized for a week, two, or three weeks later. Somebody jokingly said, maybe we'll know them by Christmas. I hope it's before that, but uh, who knows? <laughs> so on to your questions. Thank you very much, Steve. That was uh, expect unexpected. I think it sums it up perfectly, and uh, obviously the concern about how long it's going to take to 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 count the vote is a real one. I, I was working on the Hill, working on that recount in 2000. So it, just that one state was, in the, and the couple of counties in there uh, took took a long time. So let's hope for not to have a repeat of that. I just uh, want to remind everybody on on the call that you can continue to submit your Q and your questions and using the Q and A function in Teams, and we will try to address as many of them as possible during the program. But now we're going to turn to a, a moderated discussion with uh, Mikael Tornval and Steve. Mikael is a, a well-known journalist here in Sweden. He's with Svenska Dagbladet, which is one of the leading daily newspapers here. He spent more than 25 years as a journalist and communicator, and he knows the U.S. well. Previously, Mikael served as the U.S. correspondent for Dawkins Industry in New York and among other positions as a political reporter and communications specialist. So with that, I'll uh, turn things over to Mikael. Okay, thank you. And uh, really excited to have Steve here to ask questions since I'm sort of feel that like the amateur here among journalists having covered only a couple of U.S. elections. So. Steve, I really have to ask you this question as a less experienced journalist. Have you seen anything like this as a journalist? And also, how do you manage to cover a campaign where you have one candidate who is a real Washington DC insider, who's been a, a senator for decades, who's been a vice president, and on the other hand, uh, uh, he is an incumbent president now, but he had no prior political experience and definitely don't act as a typical politician. How do you handle this and how do you cover it? You know, in a couple of different ways, and I think part of it is we have to go back to what happened back in 2016. As many of you might know, we do a program called The Washington Journal, and every morning we try to get 50 to 60 calls in a three-hour program. <clears throat> and we could tell 
uh, certainly in mid to late October, especially after the whole Comey is the FBI director, Hillary Clinton email uh, development came up, reminding voters about the whole email exchange. Um, and remember the whole Access Hollywood video. So I mentioned being in St. Louis at the debate. I'm going to come back to your question, but I just want to put a specific example out there. So we're in the debate hall in St. Louis and who walks in but uh, Paula Jones, Juanita Broderick and other people associated uh, with Bill Clinton with allegations that he had sexually abused those women. So, so Donald Trump very effectively tried to shift the focus away from what he said. And if you watch those debates, he talked about what Bill Clinton did. Uh, and I think we're seeing that right now with the law and order campaign by the president versus uh, the Biden campaign talking about <clears throat> coronavirus and, and the economy. Um, you're right. I mean, we, we a few people, I don't think any, uh, Donald Trump did not get a single major newspaper endorsement in the country in 2016. Just think about that. That was incredible. But he, he very effectively tapped into uh, the sentiment in this country. I, I'm, I'm from a big family, so I have 15 brothers and sisters. And I, in my family, I can tell you that we have the Trump people and we have the Biden people. And so maybe that's been a good lesson for me in trying to figure out the pulse of the country, which is why I said at the outset, we cannot take these polls uh, at face value. This thing is gonna change and shift and turn. And the president has the bully pulpit. Uh, we've seen that over the last uh, four years or five years, he's been able to shape the narrative as the candidate and certainly as president. And so we know that he's going to continue to do so. We don't live in a 24-7 news cycle. We live literally in a minute-by-minute -minute news cycle with his tweets, with the, the, the rapid response from the Democrats. Uh, and you're right, we've not seen anything like this before. Um, he is a very different kind of president. There's just no question about it. And a lot of people love that about Donald Trump because he's not part of the establishment. They love the fact that he is not an institutionalist. Uh, and, and so that's really the other underlying factor. Do we wanna go back to a new norm or does a country like the fact that we have somebody in the White House who says, we don't care about the EU, we don't care about NATO, it's America first. And that's an underlying factor in this campaign. Uh, so maybe a way to understand where we stand today in terms of you mentioned that uh, you can't say, take for granted that uh, Joe Biden will win even if he's ahead in most polls. And I believe that uh, a lot of people in Scandinavia wants Joe Biden to win. But if you go back to 2016 and look at why was everybody so convinced then that Hillary Clinton would, was going to win? most people thought by a landslide and that didn't happen. What mistakes did we do then and uh, how do you, what kind of lessons should we take into understanding this election? Well, there are, I think the biggest mistake was that people uh, believed the echo chamber. People believed uh, Nate Silver, people believed the pundits that said that, that, you know, there's no way that Donald Trump could win. Again, that's why with our callers, we could very easily see a path for Donald Trump to, to win the presidency. The other thing is, one of the biggest um, misnomers is that the polls were actually right. The polls on the Sunday before election day had Hillary Clinton up nationally by, if you look at real clear politics average, by anywhere from 1.9 to 2.4% or 2.5%. And she won the popular vote. The problem that we had in 2016, as all of you know, is that we have this thing called the Electoral College. And that's what determines who's going to be elected president, set in place by our founders for a very simple reason. They wanted to make sure that small states had a say in electing the president, states like Rhode Island and Delaware. And so they came up with this compromise that would, would allow the president. And we've had a couple of instances, you know, certainly in with uh, uh, the, the Hayes-Tilden dispute in our American history, and more recently, of course, with George W. Bush and Donald Trump. So twice in 20 years, uh, or less than 20 years, it was the Electoral College, not the popular vote. There's the debate in this country, should we get rid of the Electoral College? Certainly Democrats are in favor of it. Republicans see the advantage for them. Uh, the, one, the one good thing about the Electoral College is it's forcing the Biden and the Trump campaign to be in Wisconsin, which only has 10 electoral votes. I mean, if you look at where the Electoral College votes are, it's California, New York, Florida, Texas. Uh, and so if you want to run up your vote totals in those states, you don't need to worry about New Hampshire or North Carolina. 
Um, my guess is that we will not change that system, that the Electoral College will stay in place for the foreseeable future, uh, despite its flaws. And I think that was the biggest mistake. The people just took at face value uh, the polling, but more importantly, the, the, the media echo chamber that was inherent in this town and in this country. If you watched the Sunday before, I think few people predicted Donald Trump was going to win, and people just believe that. Um, and some have said that, and I asked the president, I did an interview with him last summer, and I asked him, did, did you expect to win? And of course he said yes. Uh, but there's some around him that said that, you know, he was preparing to, to go back to private life and begin to continue his business career and, and, and maybe more development. So um, uh, I did talk to Sean Spicer, who was the press secretary, and I said, when did you know Donald Trump was going to win? And he jokingly said at about midnight on Election Day. So uh, a lot of back and forth in terms of exactly when they thought he was going to pull this uh, incredible victory for him back in 2016. Uh, so and I think the other big question besides uh, what actually difference in in real politics is or policy is uh, when will we have a result uh, with the the risk for litigation and so on and also let's imagine that uh, one candidate wins the popular vote but not the electoral vote like last time will that result be accepted by the american people if that happens if one candidate wins the Electoral College and the other has the popular vote, uh, I think that the divisions in this country will continue to deepen. Uh, but they're already pretty deep right now. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, as I said at the top of the conversation, between Black Lives Matter, race relations, the economy, and coronavirus. Uh, and you think about coronavirus, it's, it's something that has affected every American in one way or the other. We've all been impacted, whether, you know, I have a daughter in sixth grade taking classes upstairs right now, so she's continuing the virtual learning that she began in the spring. My wife is a nurse, and so she's been on the front lines dealing with COVID patients. Our workplaces have changed. This will forever change our country. So in, in, in that respect, I think we're going to see a further polarization. What the experts say uh, is that if one candidate is able to get 5% or more of the popular vote, then this will be a very clean result. And my hope is, just for the country's sake, that whether the president wins or whether Joe Biden wins, the person who does win, wins both. Because I think that that would be good for the country. The results would be clean and clear, and everyone understands the president has been reelected or Vice President Biden is going to be the 46th president of the United States. Um, we don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, as I said, this is going to be a campaign that's going to be fought in a couple of, a handful of states. Uh, it's going to be one that could be very, very close because the support for the president is strong and the support for the, uh, Vice President Biden is, is is strong, especially because people are looking at, um, you know, the, the president and, and, and uh, what he has represented. The other factor I should mention in all of this is that we have a growing number of Republicans who are, uh, you know, joining the Biden campaign effort. And so we don't know, we saw some of that, the never Trumpers in 2016. We're not sure how deep that is, how strong it is, uh, because countering that are the people who are for the president more than ever before. And again, we hear that in our calls. So the race is most certainly going to narrow. Um, and I'm hoping it's a clean victory for either the president or for Vice President Biden. And you also mentioned this concept about the October surprise, and we actually had a few of them uh, uh, in the last election cycle. Uh, but what kind of surprises do you think we could expect? And also, do you think that uh, the campaign or uh, outside groups are sort of keeping some information to be able to release them as a su October surprise uh, uh, a week before the election or so? Um, y yes, I think that there is, there is information from both campaigns. My guess is if it comes out, it probably is going to come out earlier in October uh, than mid to late October for a very simple reason. We have so much early voting in this country. Uh, in terms of another October surprise, I guess if, if I knew what it was, it wouldn't be a surprise. But I do think the coronavirus vaccine is going to be a, a big question mark out there. And we're seeing part of that right now. Uh, to the president's credit, uh, Operation Warp Speed has been working at a record pace to try to come up with a vaccine. Uh, the question is, has protocol been followed with the FDA and the Centers for Disease Control? I know we're working with a number of European partners, um, most notably in Sweden and Norway, in terms of developing this vaccine and the testing that's going on. Uh, and that 
just like wearing a face mask has become a political issue. You know, for Democrats who say, I'm not going to take the vaccine, well, Republicans are saying, well, it's just because you don't like the president. So who would think a, a health issue would become such a big um, political football? But it already has and it will. So I think the vaccine could be one big question mark in October. To your point, if both campaigns have information, you know, you got to wonder, though, with everything coming out with the president, all these books from Mary Trump to uh, to his former aide, uh, the, the book that's coming out today. I mean, so many uh, John Bolton's book, The Room Where It Happened. You wonder if you become numb to any of the accusations uh, against the president. And finally, which is going to be sort of impossible in two minutes, but still uh, we talk a lot about the differences between the candidates when it comes to personality and background, but not so much actually about policy. So if you just briefly could explain, do they differ as much in policy and what kind of politics they will uh, pursue if they are elected as they differ as uh, personalities? Well, if the president is re-elected, um, I think you're going to see him certainly continue to try to appoint conservative judges to the Supreme Court if there's a vacancy and to the federal bench. But I think you actually might see him move to the center a little bit to try to build a legacy uh, with Democrats. Uh, you know, he's the guy that wrote The Art of the Deal. And I think if you look at one of the big issues, which gets to what you all do uh, throughout uh, Scandinavia, which is, you know, you have such a great infrastructure system and we can learn from what you have in your countries. And I think Joe Biden, who took the train every day to work uh, as a U.S. senator, certainly feels the same way about roads and bridges. So I think on, on that one area, you could see uh, if the president is reelected and certainly if, if um, Joe Biden is elected with control of the House and the Senate, that they're going to move to the center on, on things like that. You know, second term presidents really want to build their legacy. And I don't know how Donald Trump would view a second term in terms of what we're seeing right now, his tweets and everything else. Um, but you, you want to believe uh, it, that past his protocol that uh, he's going to want to try to, to build something that, that he can point to uh, to the history books. If, if Biden is elected president, uh, again, if he has the Senate and the House, then you could see a, a much more progressive agenda by the Democrats in the first two years. But the cautionary note I would say to that is that when a president reaches too far, look at Bill Clinton in 1992 and uh, Barack Obama in 2008, 2009, they then take a, a whipping in the, in the midterm elections. So that's a, a cautionary note for the Democrats as they move, you know, if they have the House, the Senate and the White House moving too aggressively uh, could hurt them in the uh, 2022 midterms. OK, thank you, Steve. Uh, I'm going to give turn it back to Peter now for some questions from Amcham and then come back later with the questions from the audience. And I just want to remind everybody again to file your questions and we we'll try to answer them later. Back to you, Peter. Thank you, Mikkel, and thank you, Steve. You guys surfaced obviously a lot of uh, interesting uh, discussions and insights there around the complexities of the U.S. system and the and the the issues that are going to come to come to bear in the uh, the campaign itself and the differences between the candidates. But uh, to get a flavor for what's happening around the Nordics, I'd like to turn to my Nordic colleagues uh, and find out what sort of what's top of mind there. Starting with um, Jason in uh, at Amcham, Norway. Peter, thank you very much. And uh, Steve and Michael, thank you very much. Um, I have a bunch of questions uh, and I've been sitting here trying to kind of rank them or figure out which I'm going to ask. Um, Steve Scully, if it's okay with you, I'm going to ask you two questions and you can decide which, if either of them, you want to answer. Um, first, uh, you mentioned uh, Hillary Clinton um, and her lack of uh, ability to show why she should be president as uh, uh, being uh, very difficult. The factor for her and last time around is Joe Biden doing enough to show why he should be president in your opinion um, in other words do uh, do COVID and social unrest considerations uh, outweigh pocketbooks uh, if uh, it were to put it on a, a simple uh, a simple uh, platform and then the the second question um, in your experience um, and 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 all the people you communicate with on a regular basis what might be some of the nuances that we uh, that are watching this presidential uh, race from outside the United States, uh, what might people be missing uh, in their uh, in, in, in what they're hearing and seeing uh, as witnessed from uh, abroad? Thank you. Sure, well, I can answer both of them. Um, 
Let me take the second one first, uh, because there's there's a famous interview that Roger Mudd did with Ted Kennedy. He asked a very simple question: Why do you want to be president? Um, and I think that that's really the question that voters are going to be asking: Why do we want Donald Trump as president for a second term? Why do we want Joe Biden? I think both campaigns did a pretty good job outlining what they would do in a Biden administration or a Trump administration during the conventions. They're, they're prepackaged events, but I thought that uh, I, I thought the, the, the president's speech really laying out what he wants to accomplish and the, the Biden speech, I think, did that. But the other thing that I think, and again, I, I look at history for a guide in all of this, is that in 1980, again, the last one of the last times we had a sitting president who was defeated, if you look at the polling leading up to early in mid-October, both uh, from the Gallup polling and the Harris organization, both Biden and Reagan, I mean, uh, Carter and Reagan were pretty much neck and neck. It wasn't until that last debate that Reagan said to the American people, I can be president, and the American people said, I can see Ronald Reagan as president. So you mentioned the debates, and, and I'm gonna have a role in them, but I think that the key is will be these debates because it's going to be a chance for voters to really size up both candidates at the same time. And if you look at 2016, if you look at the pundits, they said Hillary Clinton won the debates. And of course, Donald Trump still won the presidency. In this case, you're going to have, you know, two men in their mid to late 70s. And the president's already gone after Biden saying that he's, you know, not up to the job. And and the, the Biden campaign is responding in kind. So the debates will be, I think, the last moment that you're able to see both candidates in an unfiltered format answering questions and those are going to be the key. The debate that took place between Reagan and Carter was in late October. It was in Cleveland, Ohio. There was only one debate in 1980 because a lot of back and forth, which we don't have to get into between the Carter and the, the Reagan campaigns and whether third parties should be participating. But these debates, especially the first one, Chris Wallace is going to moderate that debate. It's going to take place in Cleveland in three weeks. So that's, I'm going to be looking at the polling, the performance, and that will be a real bellwether in terms of how we move into October. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, I'm going to ask a little bit from a journalist perspective. We're seeing a political polarization in the U.S. Uh, and there's a sharper divide than ever, uh, I think I, you could say, between political parties. How is that polarization actually affecting the media landscape you work in? And other than C-SPAN, where do you turn for your media consumption about this election? You know, it's interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, the good news is that there's more news and information out there than ever before. The bad news is there's more news and information out there. Than ever. <laughs> yes. And, and the problem is that everyone can be a reporter from, you know, their smartphone and social media and Twitter. Everyone can express their point of view. Uh, in terms of where I go, I try to be a good consumer of news. And so my day begins with CNN and Fox to try to get a sense of, of what they're talking about in the 6 a.m. hour, National Public Radio, Wall Street Journal and The Washington Post, The New York Times Online, Politico. Uh, I try to go to a lot of the opinion pieces. And as I mentioned, you know, I, I try to figure out what the other side is saying so that I can present a balanced point of view. As I mentioned, I have a, a big family, and so I tell the Trump supporters, you know, you should listen to Rachel Maddow, and you, and you should uh, listen to what uh, uh, Sean Hannity is saying or Rush Limbaugh. And to those who do not like President Trump and my family, I said, you know, you need to understand that point of view. You, you need to go back and forth and, and understand where we are. But what, what's happened is that we get into our own silos in this media. And as we're seeing in the cable industry, opinion journalism is very lucrative. I mean, Fox and MSNBC have done a very good job trying to carve out their own niche in primetime programming. And that's fine. And, and, and watch their programming. But it, I do think it has divided the country in a way that um, maybe was not expected as we see the, you know, the fragmentation of our media and socialization and social media. You know, you can be on Facebook and just get the news that you're comfortable with. Well, you need to challenge yourself and find out what the other side is saying. And uh, from Amchem Denmark's side, Steve, thanks again for a great presentation and discussion. And uh, and by the way, I was really pleased to hear you've had, had a chance to spend some time here in Denmark. I, I was going to show I had this behind me, but I didn't want to hurt the other people. But this is. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Very nice. I love Copenhagen. But, uh,
Steve, let me pick up on, you know, you said expect the unexpected and you've got the job of, uh, you know, moderating the upcoming, one of the upcoming debates. Um, I guess, is that on October 15? Yes, in uh, Miami. Yeah. So my question to you is more, more just real practical. You're thinking about it because, um, you know, this is a going to be a brutal election. And sometimes I just want to fast forward until whatever time in, you know, late November or whenever it is we have an, a, a decision. But, you know, how are you going to keep the two apart? I mean, how are you going to, how, what's your approach to a debate like that? Because Donald Trump has shown to be extremely uh, difficult to uh, manage in these things and it gets pretty low. So what, what's your thoughts? Well, I think my approach is to be completely fair. Uh, the, the good thing about the town hall meeting is that the questions come from the American people and from those in the room. And so I think it's going to be a good chance to really get beyond um, the, the, the questions you might expect. And my guess is that the, they're, they're going to be respectful. You know, I don't want to get too much into the debates themselves because I haven't done them yet. Um, so I'll let my work speak for itself. But I think, uh, I mean, the president one on one is very gracious. Uh, he's, and, and so is Joe Biden. I mean, I think you're right. These debates are going to be critical. They're going to get a lot of attention. Uh, and, you know, as I as I told the commission, nobody is watching the debates to see how I do. It's really to see the two candidates uh, interact with each other. And um, so I'm, I'm going to leave it there for now because I don't want to get too far ahead of this. But uh, it's it's going to be a challenge. But I think um, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for your interesting questions, by the way. And with that, and we're going to take some questions from the audience. And I'm going to do the same, jump right in with what people are asking, because that's what it's about. And the first question is about the other big story right now in the US, and that is connected to Black Lives Matter and the riots. How does that help and hurt the two candidates? What's going on uh, with the riots and with the uh, Black Lives Matter? Well, this has been one of those stories that, um, you know, I spent some time as a reporter in Rochester, New York, and that's now become one of the flashpoints in terms of Black Lives Matter. Uh, I think what it has done, very obviously, is it's given the president a, a path to say we need law and order in the streets, and he's very quick to to blame what he calls Democrat cities, uh, whether it's or Democrat states, New York, uh, Portland, and the, the state of Oregon, uh, Chicago, and the state of Illinois. So what it's done is added yet another layer to this campaign, a campaign that's already seen, you know, the whipsaw of issues from coronavirus to the economic. Uh, meltdown earlier this year, beginning to re recover now, and now Black Lives Matter. Uh, and as a reporter, I mean, it, it's been incredible. You almost become numb to all the different, the, the, the rapidity of uh, these developments. But Black Lives Matter is going to be, continues to be a really big issue. Uh, it's going to be part of the narrative. I think it was certainly a, a factor uh, for Joe Biden, because he received enormous pressure to select a, a, an African-American running mate, certainly somebody who's qualified as a U.S. senator, as a former presidential candidate. But, you know, in a year that has seen so much happen, um, just another layer that um, will that voters will take into effect. I'm hoping it's going to be a record turnout. I'm hoping people are animated on both sides of the aisle to express their point of view. And again, to go back to what I said earlier, I'm hoping that whoever is the winner on November 3rd or whenever we know the winner, that is a clear victory, both the popular vote and the Electoral College, because I think that's that would be good for the country. And, and we also actually have one question about the Electoral College, and that is uh, uh, somebody who wants you to explain more in detail. How does that actually work? Because I, I think that people might have heard of it. People have heard that uh, uh, it's decided by the states, but if you can briefly explain how does it actually work? Sure, it is uh, It is quintessential American. Um, and one of the things that's fascinating about the Electoral College is it is emblematic of, of who we are as a country. It was one of the ultimate compromises uh, by our founding fathers. Again, the big concern back in you know the late 1700s was that the big cities and the big states would dictate who was the president. And the smaller colonies that became states, like Delaware, like Rhode Island, like South Carolina, they wanted to have a say in terms of who was elected president. And so in part because of uh, Alexander Hamilton, now known for the, you know, the famous Broadway show that's such a popular hit, th the compromise was to make certain that small states would have a role in selecting a president 
The Electoral College is based on the number of uh, the, the members of Congress that you have. So, for example, in New Hampshire, there are uh, three, ele four electoral college, no, three electoral college, four, sorry, two Senate and, and two for the presidency. Um, and it's determined, um, e e so California has the most, New York, Texas, Florida, they have a, a big chunk of it. And then the smaller states, but again, what we saw in 2016, what we saw in 2000, where Al Gore had 267 electoral votes, he only needed three more. He did not need Florida. He could have won New Hampshire. He could have won his home state and he would have been elected president. But the simple answer is it sounds complicated. It was a compromise to make certain that small states were not left out of the political process and that candidates and campaigns focused on them just as much as the big cities. And of course, you know, those cities have grown since 1787, but that was the genesis of it. And I guess that, not to answer your question, but you, you need to, to, to point out also that you, you need to realize that uh, most states has a winner take it all. Uh, yes. But you, you get all Florida's or California's vote, right. whether you win by 51 or 69%. Right. Maine and Nebraska, I think, are the only exceptions, but you're absolutely right. It, it's uh, it's a winner take all. So whether you win by, I mean, if you think about it, um, I have a daughter that goes to Penn State and they on a, a, any given Saturday will have 110,000 people in the stadium. Donald Trump won the presidency in Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin by about 70 some thousand votes. So fewer people elected Donald Trump than attend a Penn State uh, football game when there is football pre COVID. Uh, and so, yes, it's a winner take all in those states. And that's part of the debate that we're seeing in this country. Should we have it uh, proportional based on the results? And you can see that that al also opens up a whole can of worms and a new set of questions that is probably a better discussion for another day. Uh and another question that's come here is about polling that uh, uh, some of the polls failed to account for uh, as uh, the, the question asks the sh sort of shy Trump voters that didn't want to admit to, to the pollsters that they're going to vote for Trump, Trump that they were sort of embarrassed. Do, do we see that again or uh, have the polling institutes been able to compensate for that kind of errors to this year? Well, polling is such an inexact science. Uh, you're right. We have we hear from a lot of people. First of all, I've always been, I was never polled, so why should I have uh, believed these polls? And I think to a large extent, too, um, how are they getting the polls? This is not the 1980s where people had landlines. Now they're getting people have cell phones. You know, you can block those calls. Uh, I look at the polling. Well, first of all, I look at the average. Don't look at any one poll because it is a snapshot from that moment and it's often skewed, what's the margin of error? And the higher the margin of error, then the less credible the polling is. My question is not, are you a registered voter? Are you a likely voter? And then when I look at the polling, I'm looking at how likely are you to vote for Donald Trump or Joe Biden? How enthusiastic are you? Uh, and I can tell you that, I mean, th th you see them on both levels. I saw a poll the other day that the enthusiasm level among Trump supporters is very, very high. So you know that those people are going to go to the polls no matter what. Um, and so that's what I'm looking at. And the lesson from 2016 and the lesson from 2000 is, you know, what, what I tell students is polling is like crack cocaine for political journalists. We all love it. We all follow it. But you can't believe all the polls uh, and you have to kind of drill down. The best place to go to for those who want to go to the website is called Real Clear Politics. And so they do an average of all the polls. That's what I'm looking at on a, on a daily or regular basis to find out what the pulse of the country is. But uh, it is an unscientific uh, survey um, because how are you doing the polling? And are you, is it an online poll? Well, that has its own set of problems. Are you including cell phones and what percent? Because we all have cell phones and I, you know, how, how many people have hard lines these days? So those are all variables that you have to take into account when you look at those numbers and the size of the polling as well. Uh, okay, that's a science in itself. We, we have another question uh, regarding what's going to happen after the election. And the question is, it's a perfect storm that's hitting the US now with the coronavirus, Black Lives Matter, uh, and more polarized society than ever before. Uh, so the question is, what's, in what shape will that lead the US once this blows over? Well, without sounding too uh, simplistic, it will depend depend on the results. Uh, it, it will depend on whether or not um, 
There are question marks in terms of the mail-in voting. Right now, the president has been very critical of mail-in voting, saying that it's going to create fraud. Uh, so that's going to be one variable. The second factor is by how much did Joe Biden or Donald Trump win? And is it, you know, is it a, again, to go back to my earlier point, is it a clear win or are there a lot of questions? Uh, imagine if we had 2000 today with Bush v. Gore, with the, 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 you know, the tremendous growth of social media that was not really as big of a factor 20 years ago and how that's going to play out. Um, and so you're going to see both sides. And I, and I know from talking to the Biden and the Trump campaigns, they have lawyered up. I mean, they are prepared to fight on a state by state basis, the results of this election. Um, and the president has already, you know, he's already planted the seeds that the results may not be fair because of mail-in voting. He's been talking about that for weeks. So the answer to that will depend on what happens in early or mid-November once we know who the winner is. And then uh, we're going to go over to sort of more the, the political topics. And one question here that affects the, the, the members uh, of AmCHAMS is, with either Trump or Biden in the White House, how would that impact trade relations, in particular then uh, relations to China and to the EU? Well, and I cover politics, not economic issues, but I know from from my coverage of trade issues that the president is going to be very aggressive. Uh, I mean, again, here's a guy that wrote the the uh, the book Art of the Deal. Uh, he rewrote the USMCA trade agreement, uh, which was something that received bipartisan praise uh, to the president's credit. He was able to really forge a compromise with Democrats. Um, I think he's going to be very aggressive in, in trade agreements, uh, in particular, as we've seen with Brexit. Uh, we certainly have great relations uh, with all of the Scandinavian countries, and I think he's it's going to be front and center for him. But I also think the Biden campaign, uh, a Biden White House, if he's elected, would see an opening for this as well. Uh, because of the the deep and growing divisions that we're seeing with China, uh, they're going to be looking for other sources to sell American products, and they're going to be trying to figure out ways that we can work to an even greater level uh, with our European partners. And so um, maybe the president will be even more aggressive just because that's his background. Uh, he will certainly have, I, I would imagine, a new team in a second term, but um, trade is one of his big issues. Uh, you've seen that with the companies that you represent. Um, but also keep in mind that Joe Biden was was around for the first NAFTA deal, which was which really came about as a result of a Republican administration, George H.W. Bush. Bottom line, what's worked in trade deals in this country is when it's been bipartisan. USMCA is, is a recent example of that. And my hope is that both presidents, uh, both candidates who's ever in the White House next year will follow that lead. Uh, and I have another question about uh, issues, and that is uh, uh, the, the question is that a uh, lot of the topics that we talk a lot about, like, like law and order and Black Lives Matter, doesn't really, in the understanding of the person asking the question, doesn't really shift voters larger. So the question is, what will act? What kind of issues will actually decide the election at the end of the day? People vote their pocketbook. They also vote how they feel. Uh, if you think about it in, in American politics, if you're voting for a mayor, you want somebody who's going to make sure that the streets are clean and that uh, crime is uh, on the downward trend. If you're voting for a governor, you want somebody who's going to, you know, carry out your ideals, whether it's in education or taxes. But when, when Americans vote for a president, it really is a very personal vote, which is why, if you think about it, since the FDR administration, we've seen a number of presidents re-elected. Only once has that party had a third term. That was in 1988 with George H.W. Bush. But then after eight years in office, which is another lesson that people didn't take into 2016, there's a there's a tendency to just go to a different uh, uh, party. Donald Trump was the, the, the change candidate in 2016. So I think people are going to be voting. How do they feel? Are they concerned about their neighborhood? Are they concerned about COVID? Are they concerned about their jobs? And if they're concerned, do they feel that Donald Trump has their back or Joe Biden? And I think that's at the end of the day what, what this race is gonna come down to. And it goes back to the other point I made earlier, when Reagan and Carter were neck and neck ex until that final debate, 
This race in one way or the other, either for Trump or Biden, could break open at some point in mid to late October. Again, keep in mind early voting is now underway in a number of states, including Oregon and, and North Carolina. So that's one thing to keep an eye on, the lesson from, from 1980. And then how do people feel about the future of the country? Uh, it's that question that Reagan asked in 1980, are you better off today than you were four years ago? And the answer determines whether or not Trump is reelected or Biden is elected. So because it's personal, because there's so many variables, so many different layers in this campaign, that is the fundamental question that I think American voters are going to take into account over the next 55 days or 56 days. Uh, and I have another question on the same topic, sort of how, how, what, what will decide the election, and that is, do you see any indication that Trump's attempt to define Biden as a sort of a Trojan horse for the radical left is appealing to critical suburban voters in swing states like Wisconsin and Florida? Well, we're seeing that now in some of the polling. We're seeing that the president's been very effective in trying to 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 pin Biden on those issues. Uh, and I see, and that's why the Biden campaign is is fighting back so aggressively. A new ad campaign that came out today. Joe Biden is now on the campaign trail. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the big factors, again, going back to history, in 1988, when Michael Dukakis had a 17 point lead, did not fight back effectively enough and hence lost the election and really lost it in, in early September, mid-September of 1988. And so the lesson from that is you need to fight back. You have to have a war room. We're seeing that with the Democrats right now. But but look, President Trump, is a he's a very astute politician and he's very effective in trying to shift and change the narrative uh, and he's going to continue to do so. Uh, the question is, do the voters believe the president and how, how effective are the Democrats in, in fighting back? And another question, I guess, it's about sort of how, how, how many people have actually just made their mind up already and how many are still. And are you thinking that there are many voters who still are on the fence and need more input before they make up their mind? My own anecdote, uh, anecdotal theory on this is that the undecided voters are either in the low teens or the single digits. I think most people in this country uh, know who they're going to vote for. Uh, and, and some may vote for third parties, which is something we haven't really talked about, but that could very well be a variable in this election with the, the Green Party candidate, the Libertarian Party candidate. If it's close, a third party candidate could sway the election one way or the other. We certainly saw that in 2016. But I think if you ask most people, they have an opinion on uh, President Trump and on Vice President Biden. The question is, moving forward, um, how do they see the country going in a Biden or Trump presidency in, in, in a second term? And that's really the question that they're going to be asking. Well, I may not like the president's personality, but I sure like his policies. Kind of unsure about Vice President Biden, but I don't like the president. I mean, these are all questions that, that people will be asking. Uh, but just from, from my standpoint, I think most Americans, the vast majority, have an opinion one way or the other and know how they're going to vote. So what the campaigns are really doing right now is really um, going around the edges of those undecided voters are trying to sway those who are still might have their opinion, but not quite set in stone. Again, the debates uh, and the uh, the ads um, and, and what we're seeing from the president. These are all going to be variables that will determine it. This is truly one of the most fascinating campaigns in American history. We have really never seen anything quite like this. I feel like I'm, you know, on the front row seat to history, but it really has been an incredible journey over the last three years. And, you know, we just don't know where the next two months will take us. And, uh, and a question about uh, the tickets, the vice presidential candidates, they are also quite different from each other. So how, how do you think, how much difference will they make in the election? And also how they perform in the debates? Typically, a vice president doesn't really make a big difference. Um, I think if you look at, um, again, look at history, it certainly made a difference in 1960 with Lyndon Johnson. I think it helped George W. Bush in 2000 with Dick Cheney. Uh, I think it uh, probably hurt John McCain in 2008 with Sarah Palin, not because of who she was, but the selection process. Uh, I think you're going to hear from the the, uh, the Trump campaign trying to you know use Kamala Harris as a, as a big wedge issue in this election. The debates will be watchable, interesting. Susan Page is going to moderate those debates from USA Today. She's going to do a terrific job. Um, but if you look at most polling historically, 
people vote for the top of the ticket. It really is only around the edges that I think, you know, a VP nominee. And again, in this case, the selection of um, Mike Pence four years ago was not for Indiana because the Republicans were going to win Indiana. It was really to shore up the president's support among the conservative base. And there was talk that maybe the president would would uh, place somebody else on the ticket like uh, Nikki Haley. But uh, Mike Pence has done a very effective job in trying to maintain that base among evangelical conservative Republicans. And conversely, with Kamala Harris, it wasn't for California. Uh, the vice president had made a promise to select a woman as his running mate. And I think he looked at the field and realized that she could uh, not only fulfill that campaign promise, but also help among a core constituency of the Democratic Party. And those clearly were variables. She's qualified, very qualified as an attorney general and as a U.S. senator. But those were all the variables that she that he took into account in selecting her. Mm. Uh, and the final question then uh, is going to be the scary one as well, is uh, if there is a situation where Trump has a slight lead on election day, but we have a lot of absentee votes, a lot of mail-in votes, uh, is there a risk for a miscounting and also is the risk that the su Supreme Court will decide this election as well? Oh boy. Uh, yes, there is there is a fear that the mail-in voting could create uh, accusations of uh, fraud and abuse. Um, could the Supreme Court intervene? Uh, yes. Do they want to? I would say probably not. I think that uh, the Chief Justice John Roberts would want to try to steer clear of this because they're still paying the price from the 2000 election. Um, what I would say to that is that we have to be prepared for every possible scenario, either a divided return with one person winning the popular vote, one person winning the Electoral College, a clear victory, uh, uncertainty in states. Uh, questions over mail, mail and ballot. Yes, there will be accusations of fraud. I mean, the the other, the bigger issue I think though isn't fraud. It's how long is it going to take to get these ballots counted? Um, and we saw in some some primaries, including up in New York, where it took about three weeks for a congressional race to be counted. And so that creates three weeks of uncertainty and news coverage and opinions and charges back and forth. And that's the other thing that we have to be prepared for. But uh, the short answer is. Every scenario is certainly a possibility going into this election. OK, and I think with that we need to wrap the Q&A up and uh, I hand it over to you, Peter. Thank you, Mikael, and thank you, Steve, for a, an engaging and thought provoking discussion. A little scary there at the end, um, but these are the things we have to, uh, I guess, uh, be prepared to digest. Um, as, as, as Steve started at the top of this, you know, we have to expect the unexpected and it's really imperative uh, to be a good consumer of news, gathering insights from myriad and many news sources across the spectrum to understand what's happening. And Steve, I just want to wish you best of luck on the 15th. I think the commission made a wise choice in you as a moderator. And um, uh, yeah, I look forward to, to watching the debate. And I want to thank all of our Nordic friends and colleagues for making this series happen and for your partnership. It's more important than ever now during this uh, this period of time with the COVID pandemic. And I also want to thank each and every one of you who joined us today and encourage you to join us for our next Nordic AmCham session on October 5th, which is going to be how American public opinion will shape the next uh, U.S. administration with Bruce Stokes from the German Marshall Fund in Washington. And that's going to be um, a very interesting conversation as well. So thank you all again for joining us and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you all very much. It was a great pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you.